interest of time and um, making sure that Jason has all the time to share and then we have all the time to discuss, I'm going to go ahead and introduce him. So Dr. Jason Silvernail has been practicing, phys uh, practicing physical therapist since 1997 on active duty in the United States Army as a career military officer with over 25 years of service. Dr. Silvernail has worked with a wide variety of patient populations and settings, including orthopedics and sports, chronic pain, amputee, and neurological rehabilitation and strength and conditioning. So Dr. Silvernail has um, several degrees and is board certified in orthopedic physical therapy, and I'll let him share more details if he would like. Um, he is a clinician and a researcher, and he's published clinical commentaries and original research in the medical literature, including the Journal of Orthopedics and Sports Physical Therapy, Manual Therapy, and the Journal of Manual and Manipulative Therapy. He has a prominent professional presence online where you can connect with him via Facebook or Twitter. I'd like to make sure you know that his opinions are his own and do not represent the official policy or position of the United States Army, the Department of Defense, or the United States government. So welcome, Jason. It is always good to see you. Hey, Sarah. It's great to be here. I've never had anybody do my, um, do my disclaimer for me. I'm so pumped. I'm so excited. Like, that is the level of service that uh, Rajan provides here at the San Diego Pain Summit. And so I am very, very excited to be here. I'm, it's great to see everybody out there. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there to, to see you in, in all in person. But uh, I'm here doing some Army stuff. So um, I, I was not able to travel uh, and I'm here to talk to you about a topic that I think is very important, and I hope you will think it's important and enjoy it too. Uh, it's called Conflict and Safety in Critical Spaces. You can see my name there and my degrees and all that stuff if you care about that sort of thing. And also, you can see those symbols down there that represent social media, and those are all the places you can connect with me and see more of this kind of content that I put out on a you know somewhat regular basis, although I'm a little bit of a dry spell now. Just all this army stuff, it kills me. So there you go. I even have a TikTok account, if you can believe that. So you can find me there. I look forward to connecting to you. Sarah did my disclaimer for me already, so I'm not going to do that for you again. But I have another disclosure. I want to say, as we're talking about conflict and safety, and we talk about uh, de-escalation, I'm not an attorney or a law enforcement officer, and I'm going to give you advice and strategies based on principles of communication and leadership. And you've got to apply those in the various legal jurisdictions where you might find yourself, whether that's in or out of the United States, which is where I am, or other places. And so what I want you to know mostly here is that this is a practical course. The course I'm going to teach you today is going to teach you to proactively manage difficult interactions with people, including patients and colleagues, to improve your experience and theirs. It's going to teach you how to recognize early signs of conflict and de-escalate them before they worsen. And as well as it's going to help you to learn to hold boundaries with others and learn to speak up for yourself. These are eminently teachable skills. And I'm going to teach you a series of skills that you can use and a system that you can use that makes this much easier. So this, I mean, everybody goes to a course and they say, I'm going to teach you something you can use on Monday. Uh, actually, I really believe that for this. And so I hopeful, I'm hopeful that you find this, that, that it's also that way for you and that you enjoy what we've got to say today. So thanks for being here. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to understand mostly about under, understanding human conflict and how to choose the safe option. And as well as we're going to learn, uh, you know, a system of keeping yourself safe called recognition, de-escalation, and action. We're going to, you're going to learn to recognize signs of conflict. You're going to learn de-escalation skills, and you're going to learn action strategies for avoiding violence. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I know what you're thinking. Oh my gosh, this is the pain science, San Diego pain summit. Why is this guy? talking about conflict and safety. Aren't we here to talk about pain? Aren't we here to talk about rehab? Aren't we here to see Jared and Mike get into an argument? It is Mark. Sorry, Mark. Get into an argument up on a big screen about uh, manual therapy. This isn't in my scope of practice. You know, it's really not my job to help people behave better. I don't have any training for this. Like, I'm not a police officer. These are some of the things that, um, that we've heard. And here's what I want to help all of us understand. That if you work in a clinical space or a personal service or a social service space and you work with people, you are going to need skills about de-escalation, recognition, and communication. And it's all of our jobs 
to help resolve conflict. And conflict does happen in healthcare and social service backgrounds. So the next question is, why, are you, why should you listen to me? Why, why am I at the San Diego Pain Summit speaking to you about conflict and safety? Aren't I just some physical therapy guy? What? So here's, here's what I'll say. So I've got a couple of diplomas up on the screen if you want to look at those. I want to tell you that there's a reason you should l- listen to me, and here's what it is. And so I'm, I'm a graduate of the Joint Medical Executive Skills Institute's uh, capstone program with the, de- with the Defense Health Agency, also graduate of the Army Medical Department's Executive Skills course. So I've, uh, you know, I'm a graduate of executive leadership training programs. And I'm also uh, a graduate of the Army's Tactical Combatives Program. So I know how to do the, the, um, the interpersonal and the physical stuff too, right? And so I understand the full spectrum of this from recognizing, from de-escalating to action and eventually having to sometimes use your hands to defend yourself. I have skills and training in all these areas, and I want to be able to share some of that with you today. And so the next thing you're thinking is like, okay, well, you've got your little diplomas there, and that's nice for you, like army guys, but how does this apply to me? Like, like I work in a clinic, like there's there's no violence there. Well, I want you to think a little bit about that. Because here's the thing. So people in healthcare and social service professions, right? And so that, that can be pretty broad, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Occupational Safety and Health Agency, or OSHA, which is the which is the government group that does that sort of thing in the United States, they talk about healthcare workers facing significant risks of job related violence. In fact, fifty percent of all assaults in the in the workplace environment happen in a healthcare environment. So, if you think that where you're working, you don't have to apply these skills, or you're not at risk of this sort of thing happening, I'd like you to think again about that. And I don't say that to make you afraid. I say that to make us aware of what the risks might be and what we can do to uh, proactively counter them. So what I want to ask is, how comfortable are you with this topic? And how comfortable are you with the idea that you might have to apply some of these skills? Now, that's my kitty cat Lola on the screen. She looks pretty comfortable there. Um, that's the guest bedroom, which we call Lola's bedroom now because she's the one that uses the bed all the time. Yes, my cat has her own bedroom. I can't believe it either. But she doesn't, isn't she adorable too? But she looks pretty comfortable there. I want to know how comfortable are you with some of the concepts that we're talking about and with being able to handle people uh, when they start crossing boundaries. So here's a picture of a gentleman, and um, gosh, it looks like he's having some chest pain, doesn't it? How comfortable are you handling that situation? I wonder, do you know what to do when someone has chest pain? Well, I bet you do. I bet you know that because you've had training on how to handle people who've got chest pain, right? You've got CPR and what we call basic life support training, including using that tool there on the screen called an automated external defibrillator. So you have recognized, even though chances are good as you're talking to me, you don't work in in the emergency medicine environment, or you don't work in cardiology, but you understand that you need some skills in this area, right? And how long did your basic life support class last? If it's anything like mine, it was probably about four hours or so, give or take, right? So you needed some basic training to handle a difficult situation, and it took you about four hours to do. And at the end of that, you were much more capable uh, of handling that situation. Now, how about in this situation here? Now, we have a guy who, this guy looks sketchy, doesn't he? Uh, He looks pretty angry, and he's kind of up in your face. And I wonder, do you know what to do in that situation? I think the question is similar to the question we just had about chest pain. What training have you had to handle that situation? How much do you need? How long do you think it should take? Right? So I think in one of these situations, the gentleman with chest pain, you really understand what you're doing. And another one, maybe not as much, right? So what I'm really telling you about is I'm going to talk to you about first aid, right? So first aid is really what I'm thinking about when I think about these concepts. So it's a it's a, it's a paradigm that we can use to help understand what we're talking about, right? So what are the things I can't do in 40 minutes is I can't make you a master de-escalator, right? I can't, I can't help you, you know, help you hold off like three ravenous dinosaurs at the same time. I can't do that in 40 minutes, right? I also can't make you a, you know, combat athlete in 40 minutes. The good news is I don't have, I don't have to do that. This really is a first aid course. 
And in, in first aid, just as in basic life support, the training that you get matters. And the training is something that you could rely on. And one of the things we say in the military is that people don't rise to the occasion when there's a challenge. They fall to the level of their training. People don't rise to the occasion, they fall to the level of their training. And the question for you is how much training have you had to fall back to and to fall back on in a tough situation? So when we talk about first aid, let's think about what first aid courses do. They can base on basic principles, they teach you common skills, they're not designed to make you an expert. And here's what I really like about first aid courses. They prepare you to take specific actions under conditions of urgency and consequence. That's what first aid courses do. And it doesn't take that long either. Because if we're gonna think about these kinds of risks in the healthcare and in the social service arena, and most of us at the San Diego Summit, that's the arena that we're in, right? Physical occupational therapy, massage therapy, physicians, nurses, personal trainers, all that stuff. This is the kind of arena that we're in. These are some of the risks that we might face. So first aid for conflict, what I'm talking about is self-defense. And self-defense is protection against physical, verbal, and emotional abuse from other people. That's what I, how I'm going to define self-defense for you today. When you think about self-defense, I, I don't want you to think about this, right? I mean, we've even, we've even got Rex Kwon Do down there, right, from the movie. I mean, does anybody want to get kicked in the head by a guy wearing those pants? Forget about it, right? So when people think about self-defense, the only thing they think about is the physical stuff. And, and I don't think that's wrong or bad, but most of what we need to do to protect ourselves isn't physical. And in fact, the physical part is the smallest piece of it. And yet it's the piece that gets the most attention, right? So there's some concepts that'll help you understand here. So conflict that leads to physical abuse or violence almost always builds slowly. And if I have to have a physical contact with someone, in my mind, that represents failure, not success. So when people talk about self-defense, they want to talk about the physical stuff. But, I, but from my perspective, if I have to have a physical confrontation with somebody, that represents a failure in my mind on my part of not de-escalating and, and making space and, and preventing that from happening. So famous self-defense author Gavin De Becker, and if you haven't read his book, The Gift of Fear, you definitely should. He said, randomness and lack of warning are the attributes of human violence we fear most. But what I need you to know is that human violence is rarely random, and it is rarely without warning. And you can learn to spot it. And I'm going to help you with that. So let's go back to first aid, do a little bit more first aid. So many of you who've done first aid, you might be familiar with this acronym, Airway Breathing Circulation, ABC. Boy, it sounds great. And I know we've probably got some folks with some emergency medicine backgrounds or some uh, first responder backgrounds in the audience. And I know what you're probably thinking. You know, they don't use ABC anymore. We have a different acronym. Oh, I... I know. So being in the army, there, we, there's a lot of tactical medicine courses we use. I, I know that ABC isn't always the way it goes, but ABCs are really great acronyms. It really helps you manage things in order. It teaches you airway, breathing, and circulation. And it's an important way that people can frame taking actions like basic life support when, uh, when the chips are down and it matters. It helps you to have a system where you can use that to remember. Now, when it comes to self-defense, I'm gonna, not going to teach you ABC. I'm going to teach you RDA. So when it comes to this, I want to tell you about recognition, meaning noticing and classifying early warning signs and indicators. I'm going to talk about de-escalation, diffusing situations before they progress, and action, taking steps to keep yourself and others safe, and choosing the safe option. So we're going to do RDA. So basically what we're talking about is we're going to move from recognition to de-escalation to action. So let's talk about recognition. So can you recognize imminent conflict? Well, the good news is you can. I'm going to teach you how to do it a little bit. Here's what I want to talk about. When it comes to recognition, I want you to think about three things, space, body, and voice. The space you have between someone else, their body position, like their head and body position, their hands and touching, the voice, their volume, their speed, and their word choice. And recognition, remember, that's the first part, RDA. Recognition ends when you, when you recognize the risk and you make a choice to, to exit or de-escalate. So let's talk about space, interpersonal space. This, you can see this is a screen capture from, a, from, from YouTube a Conflict. It's a, it's a great channel to follow. If you're interested in this sort of thing, 
going on YouTube and looking at A&E's airline and watching the folks there de-escalate passengers who are really, really angry about their travel, that is super valuable, right? And that lady on the screen, thats I think her name is Colleen. She's kind of a rock star in this space, at least I think so. So when we talk about interpersonal space, what I'm talking about is, you know, ideally three to 12 feet or one to four meters for those of you who are not in the United States, right? So when conflict builds with someone else, you don't want to be within arm's reach, right? You don't want to be in a position where they can grab you or hit you, right? So keeping some space between someone else matters. And when you see people crowding close together to someone else, that's a warning sign. I want you to also think about a little bit about the bystander effect. You can see some folks are looking on in this screen. And I need you to know that when accidents and injuries happen, bystander assistance is reliable. If somebody has a heart attack, if there's a car accident, if somebody falls and gets hurt, bystanders tend to rush to the, to the aid of the person who's injured. But what's important to know in the area of conflict and violence, bystanders rarely assist. If you're involved in a conflict with someone else and there are bystanders around, in almost all cases, you're on your own. There are very few times when bystanders will come to your aid in situations like this. So another piece of recognition is hands and touching. What's going on with the hands of the person? What are, are they touching the other person? What is the hand location? What is the speed of that hand's movement? Are they pointing? Are they fist clenching? And you can see in these examples, this gentleman has is doing some very aggressive hand signals toward the person he's talking with. There's a really, really close space here. Um, this might be a great example of how if you're in an airplane after the security check, uh, maybe your risk of the physical part of conflict are a little bit lower. We're not going to have that kind of uh, luxury uh, in health and medicine. And so let's think about red flags for recognition, especially about hands. So people who clench their fists, or a point or move their hands towards your face. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't seem comfortable too when I have my hand toward the camera, right? When there's a fast movement of the hands or when touching the other person, if you're having an argument or someone is in an argument with you and that other person touches you, that's a bad sign. I generally don't want you to even be within close enough distance for them to reach out and be able to touch you that way. These are all red flags of an imminent problem uh, and potential violence that you should be aware of. So let's talk, let's take a look at this again apparently look very sketchy looking gentleman who definitely seems angry. And let's look at what some of those examples are. You can see he's up close and on the left picture, you can see he's pointing and pointing towards your face. That's definitely something we want to recognize. And on the right picture, you can see his head is pushed forward and you can see he's got a clenched fist as well. These are also red flags of, of imminent violence that we need to be aware of. So just by looking at this position, even if you didn't hear a thing, even if you were across the room or across the waiting room where you are, and you're looking at someone else interact with someone else, when you see this kind of stuff, this is a red flag warning of imminent violence. So let's talk about head and body position. Having the head forward or having the body angled with the weight on the back foot is an indicator of an imminent attack, right? So let's take a look at the picture on the left. You can see the gentleman, not only is he moving his hand quickly, you can tell because it's kind of a fuzzy in the, in the little screen capture I made because it's in motion. And then you can see the gentleman on the right with the, with the red sleeves on. He's in conflict with someone else and he has his weight, his weight shifted to the back foot and his body is angled back. Now, if you've ever seen this particular video, and I'm not sure if you have, if you've watched this video, this is about half a second before the man in the red sleeves throws a punch at the man on the left, right? So what I'm teaching you is eminently applicable to things that you can find uh, you know, it, you know, on YouTube in about five minutes. You can run through this stuff and see some of these warning signs, right? So having the body angled back and the weight on the back foot, having the head forward, these are all imminent warning signs. Here's some examples of that same sketchy gentleman we looked at before. And you can see what that, might, what that might look like from your point of view if you're in a conflict with someone else. You can see what a head forward looks like. You can see what the, what the body angled back and the weight on the back foot looks like. And you can also see what it might look like uh, from the side. Now let's talk about voice. Let's talk about ways to recognize that. So yelling, insults, profanity, demands, you know, all these things, they cross social boundaries. They probably violate some workplace rules that you may have where you work as well. And it's important for you to hold boundary by making clear what you will tolerate. 
boundary holding is really important when it comes to de-escalation and conflict. And it's important because we want to make sure that their boundary is held by the other person, but we don't want to challenge that person in a way that feels like an ultimatum or that feels like a provocation to a further problem. That's what we're trying to avoid. So we want to make clear what we will tolerate and what our behavior is about. We don't want to be in the business of telling other people how to behave, right? We don't want to make, give an ultimatum that might provoke a further problem, right? So when it, when it comes to holding boundaries and in, in, in the recognition process, you don't want to tell the other person what to do or say. Have you ever been really mad and been in an argument with somebody else and they told you to calm down? Did that ever work? Did that ever help? Was that ever useful to resolving the issue? I bet you agree with me that it, that it was not. And so I want you to think about holding boundaries in terms of advising what you will tolerate and what you will put up with yourself in order to continue the conversation. I want you to talk about what you will do, not what they should do, right? If someone's in conflict with you, you want to help them understand, you want to help them solve their problem, but you have conditions to your participation. You want to help them with this issue, but you have conditions to your participation. So all the things you talk about are about what you will do and say, not what the other person should or should not do. It avoids an, ultimate, an ultimatum and it makes, makes it clear to the other person if they want to continue to speak with you and try to resolve their problem, they've got to, they've got to work with you on what you'll tolerate. So let's take, a, let's take a minute and think about some of these recognition steps. And let's take a look at this image and ask ourselves, what do you see? So let's think about the interpersonal space that you might see. So he's pretty close to her in this case, isn't he? So he, it looks like not only is he close enough to touch her, it looked like his hands are extended so he could touch her if he wanted to, right? So, so she is probably too close to someone who's in a, she's in a conflict with, right? And she may be used to that because she's in an airport, but uh, those of us who, are, who don't work in an airport can't rely on that. How about the body? Let's look at his head and look at his hands, right? Do you see his chin is thrust forward? And you can see he's moving his hands in an aggressive way. And, and in some ways, they're up by your face, too. And you can also, while you can't hear his voice in a photo, you can imagine he's not speaking calmly at this moment, is he? Right? So you can see all of these indicators of, of, of an imminent conflict and imminent violence. So let's put this, kind, this idea to the test. Let's say, has anyone ever done any research on this that's helped us understand whether or not all these things I'm telling you are helpful. And this is a pretty helpful piece of research. Uh, it's from a few years ago, but it, but it uses the acronym of STAMP. And it says components of observable behavior that indicate the potential for patient violence in the emergency department. And if you work in the emergency department or you work in a place where oftentimes um, the interactions around medicine or healthcare or services are fraught or there's a disconnect between the expectation of what will happen and what actually happens. And if you're working with people uh, uh, in the chronic pain or in the emergency department uh, area, this is very applicable to you, right? And so the stamp means staring and eye contact, tone and volume of voice, anxiety, mumbling, or pacing. And in this study, they found that there were indications. These were all indications of a, of a patient who may uh, potentially... Um, be violent, right? And so I'm hopeful that as you look at that, you can you can see a lot of the same things that I was just telling you about uh, included in there in terms of recognizable behaviors. And so that when it comes to recognize, that's where we are. We need to recognize that we're in a situation that we that, that it's going to have a problem. And so now that we've recognized this location of conflict, we've recognized indications that we're going to have a problem. We have to make a decision. Do we exit? Or do we try to de-escalate, right? Now, if this is part of your workplace, you, you can't always walk away. In, in a lot of cases, you, you really have to step in and de-escalate, especially if you're in a position of responsibility or accountable leadership where you are. Uh, so you really do kind of have to step into the de-escalation space maybe more often than you might be comfortable with. And if that's the case, well, let's learn some skills about how to do that. So I, when I think about de-escalation, I think about de-escalation de as an off-ramp. So I think of us driving along the road and the speed's starting to 
pick up. And maybe we're going a little faster than I think we should when it comes to conflict. And I don't want to get on that highway. And that other person, they're pointing and they're yelling and they're very unhappy. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to perpetuate this. I don't want to get up on the highway. I want to take the off ramp. I want to slow things down. Right. And that's what I think about when I think of, the, of de-escalation. I think, I think of that off ramp from a, a speedy road to a quieter one. And I think the purpose of de-escalation is to solve the problem. People who have conflict with you or who are angry, they have a problem they are looking for your help in solving. I know it doesn't always feel that way. Sometimes it just feels like they're being difficult just to be difficult, but I promise you, Thinking about it in this way helps you de-escalate people. When someone's angry, when someone's pointing, when someone's yelling, when someone's difficult, they have a problem. If you focus on solving their problem, you will be much more likely to de-escalate them. I'm going to talk to you about postures and scripts and some reflective questionings. We're going to get, we're going to talk a little bit more about boundary setting and what I call offering the choice. And the choice is to, you know. Um, continue with your conflict behavior or to stop. And I want to let you know that de-escalation ends when the conflict behavior stops or when you offer them the choice. Hey, this isn't working. If you're going to continue doing this, here's your option, right? And that's when de-escalation ends. Let's talk about de-escalation. Here's the four-step thing I want you to think about. Like when you when you go in to de-escalate, you think to, to yourself, okay, this person's having a lot of conflict. Um, this is kind of a really tough situation. It's very stressful. What do I do? Well, the first thing I want you to do is to adopt a nonviolent posture. Then I want you to use a script to open a discussion. I'll get to scripts. I know what you're thinking. It's okay. I want you to manage the space and the voice volume of the conversation that you have. And then you can defuse the conflict and solve the problem. So let's talk about nonviolent postures. I'm going to talk about two different nonviolent postures I want you to use today. And the first one you can see on the left is the thinker, or some people call it the Benny Hill. You have to be a certain age to know who Benny Hill is and why this is the, called the Benny Hill stance. Um, maybe we can get that at the Q&A. But that's the first step. The first step is the thinker. It's one hand crossed across your body, the other hand here uh, against your chin. It puts your hands in a position to be able to protect yourself if you have to, but doesn't provoke the other person. And that's the, the, that's the thinker stance first. That's the first nonviolent posture I want you to use. The second one is the negotiator stance. And the negotiator stance looks like this. Hands up, palms out. So I see all of you sitting there. And if you're sitting there and you're watching along at, at home, I want you to push your chair back a little bit. And let's practice a couple of these uh, postures. The first thing I want you to do is take one hand, your non-dominant hand, and put it across your, your rib cage. I want you to bring your other hand up and I want you to put it on your chin. And this is the first nonviolent posture that we're going to enter into as we start to de-escalate someone. This is the thinker posture. And now we're going to move to the second one, which is the negotiator. I wonder why they call it that, right? Hands open, palms open, palms facing, and move your fingertips just kind of below your eye level, right? And this is the negotiator stance, right? In both of these, they signal to, they do a lot of very valuable things. We'll, we'll get to that in a, little, in a little bit. But these are two positions I want you to start with. So the first part of de-escalation is adopting a nonviolent posture. Okay, you can put your hands down now. So let's look at nonviolent posture being applied, right? And so here's an example of, uh, of our friendly neighborhood airline agent and her agitated customer. And let's take a look at the real world applications. There's a couple things you can see. Number one, you can see her negotiator stance. Posture, and you can also see that she's put a barrier between the gentleman and herself. So it's not a, a straight movement for him to come into her space. There's actually a physical object in between the two of them. That's barrier placement, very smart, right? So it's an application of the nonviolent posture. So the nonviolent posture does a lot of really helpful things. Um, the first thing it does is it feel is it doesn't escalate the other person, right? So I don't do the same kinds of things that the other person is doing back to me that escalates a conflict. Uh, and it also signals to bystanders and it signals to people who are watching that I don't want a problem, right? It signals to other people that I'm trying to de-escalate a situation, right? And that's important too. So now that we got our nonviolent posture down, we need to start entering the conversation with scripts. 
And I really like scripts and questions. I like using scripts in these situations because they're short memorized lines that you can apply when the adrenaline hits and there's stress everywhere and you're not sure what to do. Having a few short pre-memorized scripts are really helpful. It should be easy to remember. It should put pressure toward appropriate behavior. It should signal to bystanders what's going on. It should avoid a back and forth argument about what did or didn't happen or who is or isn't right. And most importantly, it invites an internal reflection on the person you're in conflict with to disrupt their momentum. It has to get them to think about what they're doing in that moment. And that's some of the most valuable de-escalation is works exactly like that. It prompts an internal reflection, but it also has to fit the social and cultural background that it's used in. So where you are in the country that you're in and what the typical uh, culture is like is going to have a lot to do with an effective de-escalation script. So let's talk about opening. So we, we're going to de-escalate. We're going to adopt our nonviolent posture. And now we're going to enter into a conversation with an opening script. And I think it's hard really to beat saying, hello, my name is, and then insert whatever it is your name is, right? That's a good way to open up a conversation. And let's look at the other two. It says, seems like you're upset or seems like there's a problem. And then it says, is it okay if I try to help or can we talk about it? I want you to notice something about those two scripts. They both end with a question mark. So they prompt the other person to give a response to you, right? And let's look at the, the, at the last opening script there. You have a right to feel angry, which is a sense of legitimization to the other person. And that you, you say, let's work this out. It implies that you are going to work and help solve their problem. So at the beginning of the de-escalation process already in the opening script, those are examples of opening scripts. Now, once we're in a, a de-escalation, and we've started our nonviolent posture and we've entered our opening script, what we need to do is manage voice volume and we need to manage space. We need to not be on top of each other physically and we need to be talking in a calm way so we can solve a problem. And so here's some scripts that we can use for managing voice volume. Look, if you're gonna yell, I can't help you. Now notice I didn't say lower your voice, right? I said, if you're gonna yell, I can't help you. Another one is, if you raise your voice to me, this conversation's over, right? So it doesn't challenge someone else. It doesn't tell someone else what to do. It makes sure that they know what your boundary is, what you will or will not tolerate in the interaction. And the, the third one is uh, sometimes a valuable one. How would you feel if it was your mother getting yelled at by this? That's another thing that invites an internal reflection to the other person about what it is they're doing, right? And here's another one. If this behavior continues, you'll have to leave, right? Now we also want to manage space. While we're de-escalating someone, we're in our nonviolent posture. We're managing the voice volume. We also need to manage space. We need to make sure that the other person is, you know, three to 12 feet or one to four meters away. So we're not right on top of each other because we're trying to prevent a physical encounter, right? One of the things you can say is I need more space if we're going to talk. I need you to step back so we can resolve this, right? And so those are both examples of holding a physical space boundary with someone else. And I really like this. If this behavior continues, you'll have to leave. Now, it's funny. In the personal space world, when there's conflict, it doesn't always start out yelling. In fact, sometimes conflict can start kind of slow. And people can be a little sneaky about it. I don't know if you've ever seen this. Have you ever heard someone having a conversation with someone and then the person just sort of advances really close, like kind of like up in their face, and they're not yelling. They're not pointing. There's no clen clenched fists but it looks like they're trying to intimidate the other person through their closeness and personal connection, right? By being in their personal space. And it's really good in that kind of case to have a script to use. And one of the ones I, I like a lot is, you know, I don't know if you realize this, but you're standing really close to me right now. And some people might see that as threatening, right? And so it's a way of calling someone out about their behavior and holding a boundary yourself, letting them know, look, I see what you're trying to do by putting your nose close to mine. And you need to know that that's not going to work in this situation, right? And so that's a really helpful uh, de-escalation script to use for managing personal space uh, when there's not a lot of yelling and, this, and it's a little bit more sneaky. So 
we've got our nonviolent posture. We've got our scripts and questions going. We've managed our, our, our personal space. We've managed the voice volume that we're both using. And now we're going to use some reflective questions. Hey, you know, do you think you have a reason to yell like this? If someone saw you like this, what would they say? What if it was your mother being yelled at like this? Do you, do you see anyone else here behaving this way? Look, would you like to talk about your eyes? All of these are sample scripts that you can use that invites a personal reflection of someone about what they're doing right now in that moment and gives them a chance to de-escalate or to calm down their behavior, right? So reflective questions are important. Remember, the goal of de-escalation is not to get the other person to calm down. It's to solve a problem. Now, if, you, if you've heard me talk about conflict uh, and de-escalation before, you've probably seen the acronym that I use, A-N-L-O-S, which is an acronym we can use when we're talking with someone else and we're trying to have a difficult conversation. And the A-N is an acknowledge or apology, and the N is for naming. So example is, I'm sorry, this is so difficult. Note, don't apologize for your behavior. Apologize for the situation. Give something a name, like name an emotion that you see, like it seems frustrating to you, right? That's the first step. And then you get into legitimization, openness, and support. Look, I don't blame you. Let's work this out. We're in this together. That's an example of acknowledging, naming the emotion that you see, helping someone feel legitimate in their, in their expression of that emotion, then you being open to solving a problem and giving them some support. One of the things we say in self-defense a lot is if you can make them talk, you can make them walk. Remember, when it comes to protecting yourself, most of this has to do with your physical and interpersonal behavior. It doesn't have anything to do with, you know, throwing a punch or rolling around on the ground or having a fight. That's the smallest part of it. If I'm trying in a conflict with someone, my goal is to get as far away from the violent part as I possibly can. And the chances are good. I want us to walk away from each other. I don't want to have a conflict. And by, by having someone talk and working them through things verbally, you're much less likely to get to violence. Violence happens when people run out of options and you want to keep the options on the table. Remember, the goal of de-escalation is to resolve the issue with a problem. The goal of de-escalation is not to get someone to calm down or behave. That will not work. We really have got to get to solving the problem. And in order to do that, we have to talk about it calmly. We have, there has to be enough space between us so that we can have a comfortable conversation. And our voices have to be lowered so that we can work through a problem. And that's really what you're trying to do in de-escalation. You're trying to get to the root of the problem the other person has, offer them options, and to give them a solution to their problem. Now, at the end of, of de-escalation, we have this thing called offering the choice. You know, if the other person won't de-escalate for whatever reason, you need to offer them the choice. I'm using my, my verbal quotes here. Change their behavior to get their problem solved or end the interaction, right? Look, I want to help. It's your choice. We can talk calmly or I'm done here, right? Again, it doesn't call out them out on their behavior. It only holds a boundary for what you will tolerate, right? And that's the end of the de-escalation process. The conflict behavior continues you have to get to the point where you offer them the choice. So that's what we talked about with de-escalation. Adopt that nonviolent posture, use your scripts, manage the space and voice volume, and defuse the conflict to solve the problem. Now, RDA, the last part is action. I know some of you have been waiting to hear about this, right? This is the action part, right? So here's the plan when it comes to action. You, you want to execute the plan when you offer the choice and the conflict behavior continues. Like any good plan, we got a plan A and we got a plan B. And plan A is always the, pref is always the preferred, and it's just to walk away. You can think about placing barriers between you and someone else, and you can move to an exit. And plan B is the get physical part, right? So you, you go from a nonviolent posture to a way to defend yourself right? So I want you to think about this. When you think about it, always think about choosing the safe option. And I'm going to get to the point where we talk a little bit about trusting in your own ability to defend yourself when the time comes. So the first part of our action plan, you've gone through de-escalation. They won't de-escalate. They continue their conflict behavior. And now you, you've offered them the choice and they continue and you have to make, you have to now execute your action plan. And the first step is to make space. You just need to end the, the interaction to walk away from the person. Recommend you don't turn your back right away, but you move away from that person, put a barrier, a physical barrier between you and that other person. Maybe it's a row of chairs in the waiting room. Maybe it's around the corner. 
Maybe it's around your front desk at the gym or clinic where you work and move to the exit. So what we don't want in, in, in make space, our first option, we don't want to move right to some kind of physical conflict. You're trying to avoid that. So self-defense author Kathy Jackson said, you know, the most dangerous place I ever stood was between a cornered cat and an open door, right? And if you've got a kitty, you know, if she doesn't want to be held, she's not going to be held, right? And so that's how I want you to think. I want you to think about it that time. You're a cornered cat. You're a cat who doesn't want to be picked up or touched. You're just getting out of there, right? That's your goal. Plan A, make space. And plan B, which we don't want to ever have to go to, but sometimes we do, is to get physical. It's the physical part of the self-defense. It's the very end of the, of the continuum. It's the smallest piece of what we're talking about today. And here's a couple quotes on the screen uh, from famous self-defense coaches and personal protection experts to give you some overall context of what we're talking about. So mostly the people who defend themselves in physical confrontation have no formal training in physical combat. And if you don't have any formal training in, in physical combat, combat, that's okay too. In fact, that's more likely to happen. And, and Tony Blauer, who's a famous combatives coach, says more untrained people successfully defend themselves every day than trained people even get attacked, right? So when, I, when you think about physical confrontation, especially if it's not in your comfort zone, the first thing I want you to think about is the fuel. I have some tips on the screen I want you to think about. If this gets physical, think about the, the fuel you're going to tap into to protect yourself. Think about, you know, I really don't like when you're at a, your presentation or it's like, okay, close your eyes and think about these. So I'm not gonna ask you to close your eyes. But what I do want you to do is I want you to think about the people and things you love most in the world. And the person in conflict with you, if they're going to get physical, they're trying to take that from you. Make no mistake. That's the fuel that you are going to use to protect yourself. And you stop the physical part when the threat ceases or you make your escape. And so here, here's an example. What, one of the things I want you to know most about physical contact, if it has to happen to you, right? If it does have to happen to you, is that even if you have no training, you can win. And here's a, here's a little example of someone just minding their own business and who was assaulted in a bathroom and the fuel that she used to fight back against her attacker and make her escape, right? Okay, so what we talked about today was we talked about self-defense. We talked about a first aid course for self-defense. And we talked about the three steps, recognition, de-escalation, and action. We talked about recognizing and early warning signs of conflict. We talked about ways to de-escalate conflicts before they progress. And we talked about action steps you can use to, to, to choose the safe option. Plan A being make space, just get out of there. And plan B, get physical if you have to. So at the end of the day, look, self-defense is like first aid. You only need a few hours of training. and You can be a lot more prepared to handle the things that you might find. And in a first aid course, it prepares you to take specific actions under conditions of urgency and consequence. And that's what I tried to do for you today when it comes to de-escalation and self-defense. And this has been conflict and safety in clinical spaces. So I'm, I can see I'm, I'm, it's the end of my talking time. So I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much for having me. All right, thank you so much, Jason. And um, we do have a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, I gotta find it in the app though. Okay, so from Lisa Van Hoos, is the bystander mm -hmm. response data similar for race, ethnic, SGM, minority, hate, aggression? Are they most likely not going to respond? Yeah, that's a good question. I've, I've actually not seen it uh, divided by like that. I, I would imagine like anything, that sort of thing is, um, is culturally determined. And I'm sure that there are some cultures and whether those match well to, to race or socioeconomic culture, I guess I don't know, where bystander intervention might be more common. Like, so if, two, if you're at a family event like Thanksgiving and, and a conflict happens between family members, bystanders are much more likely to intervene. 
When it's a question of strangers, it's much less likely. And I, I'm certainly willing to believe that it, that it can vary based on culture. I just don't have that data in front of me. It's certainly an interesting question. Um, how about, uh, well, from Amber, I imagine a lot of this would apply in domestic argument situation. Would you agree? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, anytime you're in conflict with someone else, I think this, is, this, can, be a, a, um, this can be a valuable, a, a valuable thing. Okay, I'm not seeing other questions out there. Do we have any more from the from the online participants, from the people in the room? Ah, okay. When so for Michael call sorry, I do not have my glasses on caller, I think. Um, when, if ever, right. do you feel it's appropriate to intervene um, in someone else's conflict? Yeah, that's a good question. I really think um, uh, it depends on a lot of different things there. Um, it also depends on the role you're playing in that in that environment. I, I have to say, just like, maybe it's just good to admit it, like, I'm an intervener. That's what I do, right? So when I'm, if I'm at work, like, I'm at a position of authority where I work, so I'm kind of obligated to do that. But if I'm out in the world, and there's some sort of conflict, like, I, I, I won't always step in if it's not safe to do so or if it doesn't seem necessary, but I have done that in the past. Uh, and it's something that, that you definitely should think carefully about. You should think carefully about whether you're prepared to do that, about what the safety considerations are, are there any legal considerations. And, and since um, if somebody gets hurt or is in conflict, since I have skills and training to help, I consider that part of kind of my responsibility to other people uh, in that sense too. So I, I definitely will step in at times when, when I think my, my stepping in can be valuable or um, if I think that it's safe to do so. And I think everybody's got to, got to get that, uh, got to work that out themselves. I mean, one of the things that you can, you can, you can always take comfort in is that, I mean, everybody's got this computer with them in their pocket. That's got a camera on it. So if you see something bad about to happen and some sort of conflict between people, oftentimes when people are in conflict, watching bystanders video things, boy, that can be very valuable, right? I was at, at like, I can imagine that if I'm in a conflict with someone and they, things are speeding up and I'm trying to deescalate and it's not working. If I saw somebody videotaping, man, that would be a great thing for me to say. I'd be saying, hey, look, look, there's a lot of people around. There's a lot of witnesses here. You know, she's, she's, filming this over there. Like, I, I don't, like, I don't want to fight, man. <laughs> like, this is like, we're on camera here. What, what can we do to resolve this? Right. Those are examples of, of, of how that can be a valuable thing uh, to help with the de-escalation process. Okay. And then we have a kind of a comment and a question from Aria, mm -hmm. I think online. Aria, are you in the room? I don't think so. No. Yeah. No. Okay. I just heard a noise. Um, just kind of asking, I think, from the patient perspective, mm -hmm. that you know, some people can get, can get violent, and that sucks. But to be blunt, do you really mm -hmm. think someone suffering from chronic pain would be a physical threat? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, yeah. pe healthcare workers are injured by patients, and they're injured by their coworkers every day. I mean, the the, um, the data on this from the Occupational Safety and Health uh, Agency in the United States is is very clear. Right. Like, uh, so I, I once took over a really big, the responsibility of a really big clinic, one of the biggest clinics in the department of defense. And I kind of got there. I'm just trying to get to know everybody. And I said, well, like, what are your concerns and how, what, how can I be helpful here as a leader for you? And one of the things they said on the surveys is they were worried about workplace violence. And I thought to myself, Oh my God, this is terrible. Like, like, I can't believe people in my clinic are mistreating each other. And then I, I did some follow on conversations and it wasn't, it wasn't the, the coworkers with each other. It was patients and their families crossing boundaries and being physically violent with my staff. Right. And we don't have to take sides. We don't have to pick the patient is right or the staff is right. We can, in this situation, acknowledge that there's a problem to be solved and we can de and we can deescalate it. And I had to take some very, clear steps to teach my team behaviors and, and SOPs to follow in that, in that case, because I had people pushed and hit and, you know, pinched and pushed backward over, uh, like over therapy equipment from patients and families to them, even patients who, who had chronic pain and health problems. So yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I can think that, uh, I think that way. 
And there's a lot of data that suggests that, that, that that's a problem. And again, that doesn't mean we have to pick sides. We don't have to say people are good or people are bad. We can just say that when conflict like that happens, having skills to de-escalate it on, on all sides is, is very helpful. All right. Thank you, Jason. And I think there aren't any other questions, um, but there is a vote for you to head over and help with Putin to de-escalate the situation. <laughs> That's from Kara Bennett. Or Barnett, sorry, Kara. Thanks, Kara. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Okay, so we have, uh, so that's it, I think, for you, Jason. Thank you so much for another great talk. Thank you.